Welcome back to the next episode in the unscripted commentary on the weekly Parsha. This video is mainly intended for those that watch the original video, which you can see in the card above, but it also acts as a standalone. So even if you did not see that first video, enjoy. Right now, you're wrestling invisible battles, never certain of what's real or what's perceived. For a century, quantum physics has fought this parallel war. Does reality exist before you observe it, or does observation create existence? So already I want you to feel this conflict between what's real and what's observed between seeing this AI version of me and the real me going back and forth. That was the intent behind that. To build unshakable conviction by revealing the hidden unity between modern science and ancient wisdom. So that's a narrative that I'm talking about more and more often for those that are searching for a way to strengthen or build their conviction. Reach out to me, I'd love to work with you. Let us consider how the Torah debated this 3,300 years ago, when Jacob wrestled with an entity the Torah refused to identify, calling it both man and a god or an angel. The ambiguity encodes a question your soul desperately needs resolved. And the answer doesn't just affect you, it uncovers the nature of reality itself. So there's a few things to unpack there. One is that a, a number of people have come giving me comments, both IRL in real life and also online saying, well, how can the whole idea with the observer affect in reality if Hashem is always there to observe it? So I discussed that. I haven't, I don't know if I really went into it in depth online, but there's an idea that since this higher level of Hashem is in what's called Dasa Elyon, when that higher knowledge does not really influence us here. So even when we talk about observer, we're talking about a conscious observer here. So we're not talking about a computer. We may or may not be talking about a dog. We may or may not be talking about a baby. Those are open questions as far as I know. We are talking about a conscious being a human, someone with the soul, and that's the one who is collapsing the wave function. We're not talking about this idea of a transcendent Hashem who is collapsing the wave function at all times, but it's a good question. I used to read Stephen Hawking and he would talk about if there was a God, he only knows the wave function, which is a little bit arrogant because just because you're good at physics does not necessarily mean you know much about spirituality because it's a different field and you can try to apply the thought processes from science into spirituality and religion, but not just to make blank claims like that. And so, of course, we reject that premise because we understand that God exists in a way that has multiple vantage points. And so it gets more complicated than just having a materialistic point of view of reality. The other thing I want to talk about is not just about how this affects the soul, but uncovers the nature of reality itself. We see in the Tanya beautifully, and I think Judaism, more so than pretty much any other religion, as far as I know, really discusses how your soul isn't just down here in this world for personal gain and or personal growth. And in fact, a lot of Orthodox Jews do think that. It's to do the Ratzon of Hashem, the will of God. But it's really about me in the end of the day. And there's issues there. I'm not, this is not the place for that. I've addressed that elsewhere. You can see Rabbi Manus Friedman. You can see Yoni Katz's channel, Chabad of YouTube, gets into that topic a lot more. So in chapter 33 of Tanya, it talks about the purpose for why the soul comes down into the body is to help establish a dera betach tonim, a dwelling for Hashem in this lowest world. And chapter 36 of Tanya elaborates more on what that is. The point being for this conversation is that there is a link between why your soul comes into the world and how it affects the nature of reality and the purpose of why creation happened. And that's a really cool, interesting point. You actually matter not just because of you, but in a much broader and more grand scheme of things. During the 1927 Solvay Conference, where the roots, subscribe, like, comment, really appreciate it, of the current interpretation known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics were solidified, Louis de Broglie proposed a contrarian view. For years, I thought it was de Broglie. I meant to put the text, I forgot. Louis de Broglie is Louis de Broglie 
The exact positions of particles are hidden variables, forever inaccessible because measurement disturbs them. So a lot of people who've learned quantum mechanics, who watch videos about quantum mechanics, who read anything popular about quantum mechanics, even physicists who deal with quantum mechanics, generally don't hear about or learn much about Bohmian mechanics and David Bohm. But it turns out that at least in some subsets, especially non-relativistic, from what I understand, I went to a lecture on this once as an undergrad, the results of applying Bohmian mechanics to experiments and phenomenon will result in the same way as the classical Copenhagen interpretation, which has very different implications for the nature of reality. But it's not something to really discuss so much, so I wanted to bring it up here. Wolfgang Pauli raised an objection De Bruyne could not answer, while John von Neumann seemingly proved all hidden variable theories to be mathematically impossible. You should know those are big, big names in physics for different reasons. They're not just random guys, big names. If he was right, the spiritual realm exists only when you observe it. De Bruyne, facing this mounting opposition, abandoned what he believed was correct. Jacob, our forefather. So now at this time I've brought, unlike any other devourator I've done before, I've brought in a little bit of history mixed with some tension and conflict and then lessons we can learn from that conflict as well. I'm not judging anyone, I wasn't there, I don't know all the details, but I'm taking that application of giving up in the face of opposition. But if you have enough conviction, like our forefathers did, then we should stick with our convictions and continue going strong while still keeping an open mind for any type of evidence or arguments that make sense that someone will present to you, especially if it's respectful. There took the opposite approach. When his opponent begged to be released, he refused to let go despite a long debate. For 25 years, hidden variables were deemed impossible. But what if the proof itself was the illusion? Before we continue, remember to sign up for my free newsletter so you don't miss my new principal sheet for your Shabbos table. People really love this. I got such great feedback about it. So if you go to my newsletter, hit subscribe. It's totally free. I send out usually around two emails a week. I don't sell your email to anyone. And you'll get the PDF right now. It's already out for this week. So if you go to the Substack, you can see my old articles and it's there. If you cannot find it, just leave a comment. I'll be happy to share the URL. The link is in the pinned comment under the subscribe button. In 1952, David Bohm demonstrated that von Neumann's quantitative arguments were flawed. I forgot to mention that. I mentioned Bohm before, so some attribute the theory both to both of them because even though DeBroff thought it up first, David Bohm sort of brought it back out and then was able to champion it and fight for it to become known, whereas before it was buried leading to a prolonged conviction-fueled wrestling match with his fellow physicists. This picture is a colorized picture from the original, from the 1927 conference. Some say it's the one area with the most density of geniuses ever. These are some huge names here that went on to do amazing things within quantum and nuclear rocket, all different fields uh, within physics. This is, and you can see Einstein there in the middle. This was a major, major gathering to try to figure out what to do and how to interpret quantum mechanics because it was so weird. Unlike everything else to that point where most discoveries were made with one or two or three people, quantum mechanics really got developed as a community and they had to come together to try to solidify what the consensus should be. What you're about to see is not so easy and still not resolved today. Yet, after a century, physics still has no consensus to the implications of quantum mechanics, as only 42% favor Copenhagen, while many find any interpretation to be irrelevant. I remember here at Sean Carroll, he said it's kind of an embarrassment to the field that physicists don't have an agreed upon consensus here, or at least to some level of consensus where everything else does. For example, in my field in dark matter, most people believe in dark matter. They believe in something called a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. But there is sort of a small minority which believes in MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics. But you still have a majority of people believing one way, even if you're, some are willing to listen 
to minorities. I actually have a paper with a co-author that we interpreted some results um, with Mond as well. It was one of my last papers. And I'm okay with having contrarian views, but here in, in particle physics, there is no consensus. And not only that, so many, and I've met some who say, it doesn't matter. Like, okay, whatever. I just use it as a tool to get a result. I don't extrapolate to philosophy. And you can see where they come from. But I think part of that's because it's just so weird. It's so weird. And so it's just safer to say, I don't really know. Because it's just so weird. But for those that have learned Kabbalah and Chassidus, they know that there is a lot of overlap. And we're much more, at least I am, much more comfortable discussing these matters. And there are plenty of physicists who are. And that's a major drive of this channel is to find that overlap and to discuss how the Torah itself is the fundamental blueprint that drives everything and how these interesting, strange effects in quantum mechanics are really a result of the paradoxical and really, I'd say, transcendent nature and how these interesting and or weird effects of quantum mechanics are really an outpouring from the fundamental root of a transcendent inner dimension of Torah. This multi-generational inability to resolve this question is rooted in what the Alter Rebbe taught. When you go out to war, describes your soul battling forces whose essence remains concealed. The deliberate ambiguity is reflected in physics' unresolved crisis. Jacob wrestled a definite entity whose nature remains unknowable. So now I'm connecting the fact that this conflict within the physics community is connected to the conflict between Jacob and the angel as well. Just as quantum reality operates by laws, we cannot definitively interpret. But if these stay forever reclusive, how does confronting them effect a change? When you undergo your own struggle of man versus God, for example, praying without seeing results, you're experiencing the core nature of our cosmos, a place where Hashem's presence is hidden. So that's another fundamental thing is that there is an aspect of hidden. Like at some point, it's very possible we will never resolve this dispute until Mashiach comes and shows us. Why? Because it's a reflection of something that's deep, deep down of the fact of nature of this reality that Hashem is veiling himself. So it's very possible because of that we will not see a resolution for this because that reflection of that deep idea. This same concealment explains why even the most fundamental branch of physics cannot resolve its century-long interpretation disputes. Perhaps these competing views exist in a cosmic superposition that can only be explained in a veiled world. You like that? That the superposition is of the different opinions. Creative? I think so. To collapse this universal wave function, consider that each mitzvah you perform connects physicality to a global consciousness that your awareness will not be able to access until the coming of Mashiach, when every obstacle will resolve into divine oneness. To explore... So the idea also is that doing mitzvahs allows you to transcend between the physical and the spiritual slash infinite. And then that awareness helps to bring everything down. And once Mashiach comes, we'll see the total final results of everything we're doing here, especially in the spiritual realm and the effect of the mitzvahs that we're doing. But until then, we're still in this veiled reality. Deep dive into how quantum mechanics proves the Bible's age of the universe. Click here. A lot of people really like that video. So if you didn't see in the original one, hopefully I'll put it here. It's 26 minutes. So it's worth sitting down watching, especially if you have like a laptop or a computer. And there's a lot of cool insights that I think really help people who are struggling with how to reconcile the age 6,000 years, 5786 versus 14 billion, 13.8 billion. This video, I think will really help calm some nerves for some people, perhaps you. And to watch how I shatter the illusion of science versus religion, click here. They don't click because I'm showing you a file from my computer.
But that video, the one I just mentioned, the 26 minute one is also in that playlist. And that playlist has a lot of cool other videos as well for those that are struggling with Torah versus science, religion versus science. And that's one of my goals as well is to shatter that illusion. If you'd like to sponsor one of these classes, click on the link in the description. Thank you for partnering with me while we build this unshakable conviction together. All right, click on the end screens on the info cards. I'll see you next time. Drop a comment and feel free to sponsor a video.